public access television. Thank you. So thank you, Sandy, for having me. Always glad to be here and meet uh, other people like you and other scholars in the legal field. So today I'm here to talk about Roe v. Wade. And before I get to that, I just kind of want to talk about um, constitutional protections. A lot of times you'll hear, um, oh, my Fourth Amendment right was violated or my First Amendment right is violated. But really, um, what this comes down to is actually the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause. And so your constitutional rights are applied to everybody via the Constitution, via the 14th Amendment. And that is the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And so when the 14th Amendment was passed, that clause prohibited states from abridging the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And then it also importantly and important in Roe v. Wade defined all persons born or naturalized in the United States to be citizens. And those are the people who are protected by the laws of the constitution. When laws are passed and when somebody believes that their rights are being violated, um, they have to, the court has to determine whether the right that's being violated is a regular liberty or whether it's a fundamental right. And if it's a regular right, they will apply the rational basis test when they're analyzing the law. And the rational basis test is pretty, it's pretty low key. The state that passed the law has to have a legitimate um, interest and the legislation is presumed to be valid and it will be sustained as long as the law is rationally related to whatever the state interest is. If the law, however, violates a fundamental right or affects a fundamental right, the court has to apply the strict scrutiny test. And in order to survive the strict scrutiny test, the court has to find that the legislator or the government the state has a compelling government interest in whatever is being affected and that the law is narrowly tailored to achieve whatever that specific interest is. And so going a little bit further into what is a fundamental right, there was an important Supreme Court case, uh, Washington v. Glucksburg. And this was a case that actually dealt with the right to assist in a suicide. Um, and the argument came down to whether there was a fundamental right to death. Um, the court analyzed whether this was a fundamental right that all citizens were entitled to, and they had to apply either rational basis or strict scrutiny. And what they found is that a fundamental right is considered fundamental when it's so deeply rooted in our history and traditions or so fundamental to our ordered concepts of constitutionality or ordered liberty. So legal jargon for what is a fundamental right. Now, when it came to reproductive cases, one of the first important cases that really dealt with the right to contraception was Griswold v. Connecticut. And that came out in 1965. So this was a few years before Roe. And that case dealt with a married couple. They lived in Connecticut. There was a law in Connecticut that prohibited anybody from obtaining any type of birth control. So they went to New York and they got some advice on how to prevent pregnancy and which contraceptions to use. And so under that Connecticut law, um, they could be sentenced anywhere from 60 days up to a year in jail, and they could also get a fine. And so could the doctor who provided them those, uh, that ad medical advice. So they ended up suing. And in that decision, the court very importantly laid out this, what's called a zone of privacy. And what the court found was that within the Bill of Rights, there is a penumbra of rights, including the right to privacy. And the right of privacy includes the right of privacy of intimacy between married couples. And so they got to that conclusion by analyzing some other constitutional cases that had come up prior to this that weren't necessarily enumerated rights in the Constitution, but rights such as the right to homeschool your children, the right to determine their medical care, things of that nature. And so the Supreme Court said, these all created a kind of invisible zone of privacy. And so when it comes to 
decisions between married people, they found that that was within that zone of privacy and that was a fundamental right. So the next case, of course, was Roe v. Wade. And can I interrupt you for a minute, um, Justine? So that you, so that I, I think our audience should uh, understand that that was only, however, for married people, correct? Correct. correct. Not for single people. They correct. couldn't use. They could not use birth control, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And so when we get to Roe v. Wade, this was a few years later. This was decided in 1973. So this was a Texas law that made it illegal to obtain an abortion or to attempt to obtain an abortion, except um, if the mother's life was in danger, was the gist of the law. So the appellant Roe, she was an unwed pregnant woman. Um, she wanted to terminate her pregnancy. And in her argument, she wanted to terminate her pregnancy. Uh, she wanted to be performed by a competent licensed physician in a clean, um, clinical setting, and she was unable to legally do that because of the Texas abortion law. She also said she could not afford to go to another state or jurisdiction to obtain this, and so her rights were being violated, is what she argued. So she ar actually argued that her rights were being violated in the first, fourth, fifth, ninth, and as applied through the 14th Amendment. So the court, when they were discussing this opinion, found that there's not a, an explicit right to privacy in the Constitution. However, based on prior cases, including the Griswold case that I was just talking about, um, the court recognized that a right of personal privacy or a guarantee of certain areas or zones of privacy do exist under the Constitution. This included the right to privacy in relation to marriage, procreation, contraception, child rearing, and family relationships. And those all came from prior cases leading up to this. And then the court further held that this right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. They further went on to determine that um, you know, contrary to the arguments of the appellees that a fetus was not a citizen. And the reason being was because as defined in the 14th Amendment, a citizen were persons born or naturalized in the United States. And so if a fetus has not been born yet, it is not entitled to the protections of the 14th Amendment. Um, in this ruling, the court also kind of laid out a trimester standard for when it is okay to um, intervene and, and create laws on a woman's decision to choose whether to terminate her pregnancy or not. And then um, they further held that any laws in regards to abortion had to survive strict scrutiny. So they determined that abortion, the right to privacy in regards to an abortion was a fundamental right. The next kind of landmark case that really solidified Roe v. Wade came in 1992, and that was Planned Parenthood versus Casey. In that case, there were some Pennsylvania laws that um, abortion clinics and physicians challenged saying that they created um, a burden against women's right to an abortion. The court in Casey called their decision a watershed decision. And that's important because in Supreme Court history in their discussion of stare decisis. And for those who don't know, stare decisis is the principle that the Supreme Court is founded on, the English common law is founded on that. When you decide a case, it has to be based on your prior decisions. You can't just be making law left and right with your legal court decisions. And so in Casey, they talked about stare decisis and Casey was a watershed decision, meaning that if this case was ever challenged in the future, that the court should look to not overturn it because of the importance and the principles that went into it. And what the court and Casey found, um, they actually had created the viability test, which we know now is pre-viability, there can be no restrictions on a woman's right to get an abortion. Post-viability, which is when a fetus is perhaps can uh, live outside of the womb, they cannot create laws that cause an undue burden to the woman and her right to an abortion. 
So that created the undue burden test. Um, so in this specific Pennsylvania case, they found that informed consent requirements, a 24 hour waiting period, parental consent provision, the reporting and rep record keeping requirements did not impose an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion. However, they did find that a spousal notification uh, in which a woman would have to get permission from her spouse did constitute an undue burden under the statute under Roe and now Casey. And so that case was really important. Essentially what that said is no, you cannot overturn Roe v. Wade. And it also created that undue burden test, which is what all of the states are subject to now when they create any type of law that affects a woman's right to choose to terminate her pregnancy or not. So those are really important as we kind of come into today's landscape. Today, we have quite a few attacks on, the, on Roe v. Wade and Casey. Um, most importantly, there was a case argued in December in front of the Supreme Court, and it was Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. And that is a Mississippi case in which they are trying to outlaw abortions outright after 15 weeks. And so the questions specifically that were presented to the court in throughout the procedure of this case are whether the pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional, whether the validity of a pre-viability law that protects women's health, the dignity of unborn children and the integrity or the medical profession and society should be analyzed under the Casey undue burden test, which we just talked about, or whether it should be analyzed under Hellerstead's balancing benefits and burdens. And then the last question presented was whether abortion providers have third party standing to invalidate a law that protects women's health from the dangers of late term abortions. And if you listen to the arguments that were made in December, the whole argument really rests on, well, Roe v. Wade and Casey got it wrong. And now we have medical advancements and we know about fetal harm. And so therefore those two cases should be overturned. And so that was really the basis of the argument um behind those and then most recently there is a new texas law that was passed um which outlaws all abortions after six weeks and it doesn't outlaw them it's actually very unique and the mm -hmm. reason it's unique is because the texas law allows private citizens so not a state actor uh, a state actor is necessary to bring constitutional claims it allows private citizens to enforce the ban on after six weeks. So it's not the state imposing a burden on a woman's right to choose, but it's private citizens. And so legal scholars had kind of framed it that way to really get past whether that can even be argued in the Supreme Court, because in order to argue the constitutionality of any type of law, you need a state action or a government action that impedes on a constitutional right. And so that law is very unique in the fact that it creates um, an avenue for private citizens, really. Hmm. Are there any questions? Um, I have a couple, but I also wanted to tell a little story about Vermont, if, if that's OK. Please do. In 1972, when I was first living in Vermont, um, there was a very important state case called the Jacqueline R case. The real name of the case was Beecham versus Leahy. In that case, there was a woman, Jacqueline R, who wanted to get abortions, an abortion, and she was prohibited from doing so. At least she was prohibited legally in a way. And let me describe what the law was at that point, which would lead me a little bit into what's going on in the legislature now with Prop 5, actually. Okay, so there was one law on the books at that time, and I'm going to ask you about that, um, Justine. The one law that dealt with abortion was a law that said a doctor could not perform an abortion. It, the doctor could be criminalized, could, re, could go to jail if he was found to have uh, permitted or done an abortion. There were no law, other laws, though, that prohibited abortion. 
I'm not certain what it was in other states, but that was the way it was. So Jacqueline R. sued under that law. And by the way, the person that was sued was Pat Leahy, who was the state's attorney at the time. And now he's, of course, the senator from the state of Vermont. And he's a very pro-choice senator as well. Okay, so that went to the Vermont Supreme Court. And the day that that was decided, I was in the courtroom. I was not an attorney, but I was an observer, very interested in this case. And out of the, you know, chambers comes all these men judges. And I thought, oh, God, we're screwed. However, <laughs> this was the decision that they made, which was really not particularly a constitutional decision. What they decided that because a woman could, could perform an abortion herself, that why couldn't the doctor? There was no intrinsic crime in the abortion. In other words, although a fetus was uh, removed and was, you know, died in an abortion, that it was not a homicide in any way if a woman did it herself. So why then would you criminalize a doctor for doing this procedure um, at all? Because it wasn't really a crime. So the court decided that it was a contradiction in the law and therefore that the law had to be essentially decided to be void. That was in 1972, the four row. Okay, so everybody, so in other words, abortion was decriminalized and it became merely a medical decision that a woman uh, could get an abortion in private consultation with her doctor and it was the end. It was totally, it was a vacuum. There were no laws prohibiting it. And in that situation, that occurred in maybe late summer and then the legislature was gonna meet again in January and so all of us, women and men, decided that we better do something before the legislature met again to outlaw it, perhaps. And so we formed at that point, the Vermont Women's Health Center, which is still in existence today. And it was the first uh, women's health clinic in the, I believe in the United States that legally uh, could perform abortions. We went out and hired a doctor, a couple doctors, it was a total collective. There was no real authority at the top. It was a very radical little group. And they are still in existence today, except that now it's uh, part of Planned Parenthood. So I was going to ask you this, Justine. If, if uh, Roe is overturned, and it might be, there's a, there was, you know, the Jacqueline R case, 72, followed by Roe, 73. Um, and then abortion became legal, but there was always a backlash against abortion. There was always been the threat that if, the, if this weird court got appointed that was basically partisan and a Republican court, that, uh, that Roe would be overturned. But I want, uh, I want to ask your comments. If it is overturned, what do you, what's going to happen? If it's overturned, I think at that point, it goes to the states. Right. And it would be up to each individual state because at that point, you no longer have this medical decision within what was determined to be a zone of privacy. I, what do you mean by that? Okay, so this is the way I understand it. It would go, it's not, I think many people out there uh, are under the impression that if Roe is overturned, that somehow abortion is gonna be illegal, but it's not. What, what it means to overturn that federal case in the US Supreme Court, it means that the whole issue returns to the state and then the legislature would be taking it up, correct? Correct. Okay. So what is the, what would the legislatures then do? Say for instance, that all of a sudden that right to life, so-called that organization, what would they propose? Would they propose again that abortion by a doctor would be illegal? What kinds of things that would happen? What kinds of things would happen? Well, tell us a little bit more about Texas because Texas, the legislature in Texas did pass a law, correct? Correct. And as of right now, the Supreme Court has decided not to enforce an injunction preventing that law from taking, taking place. Effect. 
Mm -hmm. Correct. And so, um, and I think really what the issue probably comes down to is where the standing is. Because if the law allows private citizens yeah. to enforce an abortion ban, then I don't know where the standing would come in to protect that right, um, because it's not a government actor. In other so, words, what do you mean by that? So any person in Texas who assists, not assists, who knows that an abortion is being performed, can what? They can tell sued. the police who? who they can be oh, sued. Can sue who? The woman, the clinic, who? The, or the Whoever. Uh, so I don't think they can, as of right now, sue the woman, but anybody who drove them, a doctor that performed it, anybody that assisted in any way, shape, or form can be sued by- Civilly, any, civilly, right? Any Yes, any private citizen. So it's not criminal. It's in the civil courts for which what? The, the, you know, if a clinic was found to have allowed an abortion, then the clinic would have to pay somebody damages or something, or do you know? So I'm not sure how it's playing out yet. Um, I believe they can also seek injunctions to prevent somebody from uh, assisting, although I don't know how well that would ha stand legally. So, but I'm not quite sure how it's playing out yet. It's still pretty new and it's been kind of in the, are they gonna allow it to be enforced? Or are they not gonna allow it to be enforced? And they just, they did just take it up for a hearing, but it was just on the standing issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, th but, there, but there are other things that a state might do. For instance, in Vermont, even I think when I was in the legislature, they tried to pass, and especially in New Hampshire too. They, in New Hampshire, they did, in Vermont, we didn't. Pass a law that said a minor has to get parental consent to get, have an abortion, a minor, you know, a woman then under 18, correct? Okay, yes. that, however, that did not pass constitutional muster. You, you know that, right, Justine? Well, I know that in um, Casey, it did. It did, so there are certain states where parental notification can happen. As long as there is a uh, judicial Bypass. overreach, yes. As long as that's in place, then yes, then it, the parental consent or you know information was not found to be an undue burden on a woman's right to choose. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, okay. So that's what I think is gonna happen. If it's overturned, I really would like uh, women and men who favor this right to understand that that does not make it automatically criminal. It means it returns to the states. So in other words, if you're an activist on this issue, um, I would guess that the message would be to keep your state safe. And I think Vermont is trying to do that, but maybe there are other questions. Okay, any other, Elsie? I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah, but um i don't really understand that can you hear can you hear me yes yes yeah. there is a, a woman is performing a, let's say the example of texas of what the, the texas yeah. example that she gave the, the woman wants to perform an abortion and anybody who will bring her to a clinic, private clinic okay can be sued right. sued by who you i've heard by anybody, but who are these anybody? <laughs> Any citizen of the state of Texas. As long as they know that this woman performed an abortion, so they can kind of uh, uh, la denoncer, or do you say that? Denounce. Denounce her, just like that, and, okay. And also, um, I know a story in, that happens in 1984. Oh, we didn't talk about the time of the abortion, the time lapse. Mm -hmm. Three, uh, 12 weeks, okay, you are allowed to have an abortion up to 12 weeks. This is legal. Mm -hmm. Well, is it, is it, just, I, just, just about yes, it. is it legal or is it something that, that you can do, that they allow you to do, but it's not in the law? What happened? And you have the private clinics 
in New York City that happened in New York City, you have private clinics who do abortion after 12 weeks. Well, a lot of so to... what what is happening with this clinic if they they the people <laughs> who are they I don't know found out it happens so also. the case in 84 that you're talking about that was prior to the Casey decision so back when Roe v Wade was decided the court divided it by trimester so in the first trimester which I believe is up to 12 weeks you can there was no restrictions on any um, choice to get an abortion. And then there were some restrictions that, you know, during the second trimester, it kind of depended and the states could interfere. And then the third trimester was the states could definitely interfere and they could balance the interests of the unborn fetus with that of the woman's. But when Casey came out in 1992, that actually did the viability test, which has become more of a bright line test. And so I believe they've decided that viability is at 23 weeks. And so anytime after 23 weeks, these states can create laws. And again, it brings in that balancing test of the unborn fetus versus the woman's um, interest. But prior to that viability line, that 23 week line, there is not supposed to be any laws passed that create an undue burden on a woman's right to choose. But as far as the Texas uh, law in place right now, um, I know that there are actually a lot of abortion providers that are announcing to Texas, hey, I just provided an abortion today, sue me, as a way to challenge the law. So I think they're trying to get the law into the district court or to get it taken up by the courts to address that. You I think that um, Elsie, if I understand it, Elsie, was also thinking that perhaps abortions after 12 weeks were illegal, but they're not. Okay. okay. As Justine said, under 12 weeks, the, there are no questions asked. It's really abortion on, on demand, which is what the, the pro, uh, the anti-choice people would argue that mm -hmm. it's abort. It is up to 12 weeks. Well, that was under a row. What? That was under Roe v. Wade, but then Casey clarified it more to the 23 weeks. To 23 weeks. Correct. Oh. So Roe, even, yes, it was divided up by trimester, which I, when she's talking about in 84, uh, anything after 12 weeks could have been, it, it was up to the states kind of. Um, but in 92, when Casey was decided, that's when they pushed it to a viability line, which is around 23 weeks. Do you know that used to be the religious position in the 19th century, even the Catholic Church? <laughs> Prior to viability, they didn't make any statement about it. It only became late 19th century that uh, the Catholic Church even sort of, they, well, of course, they don't outlaw it. They outlaw it, I guess, for their own people who belong to the church, but not for normal. Mm -hmm. the, we have still in this country a separation of church and state. However, um, but even, okay, so maybe you could comment too um, on the, I remember about the parental consent. That's very confusing to a lot of people because the argument will be, well, you, uh, uh, nobody can give a kid an aspirin without asking their mother and father about it in schools, for instance. I don't know if that's true or not, but let's say it's true. So why shouldn't the girl notify a parent when and get that permission when the, she wants to have an abortion. Well, I remember Howard Dean said something that was really compelling. Howard Dean, by the way, was a doctor when he was a governor and he was totally firm on this issue. He said he had seen too many cases where the father of the mother was the father of the fetus to have her have a young girl have to tell her parent about an abortion. And I thought that was, I mean, that was his position, period. That if a woman is old enough to get pregnant, then she is old enough to make the choice whether or not to terminate that pregnancy. Um, anyway, so right. that was another way to look at that too is if a minor, uh, you know, 14, 15 year old ended up following through the pregnancy, that minor has the rights over that child. Her parents don't. Right. 
So that's another way to look at that as well is if the child was born, then they have the rights over the same parental rights that everybody does, regardless of that person's age. So right. So she cannot have an abortion. She's not allowed to have an abortion under a certain age, but she does have to become a parent. She is allowed to have an abortion, however, under Roe, uh, you know, the, in other words, what we're talking about now, I think, Justin, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the various ways a state, ha the states have attempted to restrict Ro Roe v. Wade. This is, that was an attempt. As far as I knew, parental consent was not, was considered a restriction on a woman's rights to, uh, to terminate a pregnancy, unless there was a court avenue over that, correct? Correct. Um, yeah. And so, and that's what they said in Casey was that the parental consent provision was not an undue burden so long as it had the judicial avenue to kind of go around that if need be. I mean, I think Robin had a question too. Yeah, good. Okay. Robin? You're muted. Um, in the um, abortion pill, and I, I thought I heard that it was uh, it was part of the Texas, uh, that down there in Texas, they're trying to make that difference. Could you tell, could you talk about the pill, and is that going to be an option for pregnant girls if Roe versus Wade is thrown out? And could you, I mean, I don't know whether you know about this, but talk about the non-legal issues. Do young women like the pill? Is it, 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 what does it do to the body? Is it, it does it work? And what is it called? I forget the name of it. So it's, it's RU40, I believe, something along those lines. Um, I'm not super familiar on the effects it has other than I know it can be used up to eight weeks after eight weeks, uh, it is not recommended for use. After that point, uh, DNC is recommended as the safest procedure. Um, essentially, it is a two-part pill. The first part is taken in the office with the provider, and they send you home with the second part. And I believe it's eight or 12 hours later, it is inserted um, into the vaginal canal and it essentially causes the uterus to contract and expel any contents. So it essentially causes a shedding of the lining similar to a menstrual cycle. Um, anytime after eight weeks though, they don't recommend that, they recommend the DNC procedure. But as far as the effects in Texas, that I have not heard. Um, Robin, um, if I might address that, there's always been an attempt to outlaw the morning after pill, it's called often in common parlance. The, again, the anti-choice people would like that outlawed. However, it is fairly easy as I understand it, Justine, maybe you could correct that too. Very easy to obtain. And in a way, I don't know how, I don't know how that could be outlawed unless it's determined by the FDA not to be an approved drug, but. I don't, I don't think that the police are going to be able, I don't know. I mean, that, that might be a real solution for a lot of young women. And so, and then morning after pill is separate from the RU40 pill that I was just talking about. The morning after pill is plan B. Um, that is a strong dose of birth control. And that just, so essentially regular birth control, oral contraceptive birth control, when it's taken as prescribed, it essentially prevents any eggs from your um, ovaries from implanting and fertilizing with the sperm um, and creating a fetus. The morning after pill is a strong birth control, which does the same thing in a short amount of time. Um, and it is not the abortion pill. And so a lot of critics try to they either do or they try to confuse the general public and make them think they're the same thing, but they're not. Um, obviously, the morning after pill is most effective when taking 24 to 36 hours after unprotected sex or failed contraceptive, and it just prevents any egg from being released and fertilized. Whereas the abortion pill, the RU40, actually um, is taken after a confirmed pregnancy and the uterus contracts to expel what is already uh, there. 
And so that's the differences between those two. I will say plan B over the last several years has become very accessible. You can buy at the drugstore. I think when Obama was president, he made it so you do not need a prescription for it. Um, might be useful for some listeners. It's available on Amazon, one day shipping. So if you ever know someone that needs it and they can't get to a store, Amazon will send it to you, so. Do you have a question, Matt? Oh, okay. All right, any other questions? No, I did wanna talk about the recent, um, Elsie, did you? The recent efforts in the Vermont legislature, are you aware of those, Justine? Just briefly from what you were talking about earlier. Okay, so up until a couple of years ago then, um, abortion was decriminalized. In other words, it was not on the books. There was nothing, it was merely a private matter between a woman and her doctor. And that's, by the way, another uh, statement that Howard Dean once made that I found uh, very interesting from a doctor's point of view. He said, that's what abortion should be. It should be a matter between a woman and her doctor, period, right? And that's the way it really was after the Jekyll and R case. A couple of years ago, however, some of the uh, pro-choice people within the legislature decided that because Roe was going to be, they thought, overturned, of course it hasn't been yet, uh, that they would try to make Vermont safer than it already was. And they introduced legislation which attempted to codify the language of Roe into the legislation and also into a constitutional amendment. That constitutional amendment is called Prop 5, and it's going to be on the ballot in the fall. Whether or not you want the Vermont Constitution amended, in other words, to uh, include a woman's right to choose abortion. So that's what's going on, and it's going to hit the ballot box in November. Um, so I, and I, I don't know, anybody have any thoughts about that and how that's going to go? You know. What do you think? How do you think it, it will run go in a with a popular vote? Do you think that the pro-choice forces will win or what? I guess no one has a thought about that. How about you, Robin? What do you think? Is she still there? No. Okay. I'm just to say what what I'm thinking is that. Now that it's going to be up for a vote, I think it's going, I don't know, I think it's going to be extremely controversial and that there'll be a lot of open fights about this. Vermont is perceived to be a very pro-choice state. I really don't know. I don't know. I mean, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah? Well, I think it is completely tiresome that we have to argue these stupid things over and over and over again, you know? I mean, next next uh, October, is that going to be the issue that we're going I know. to have to be working on? How about all the other issues that I know um, out there? And uh, anyway, it's, it's exhausting. Grant, Grant had something, what? How do you think the form the accounting of the uh, Women's Health Center, how that vote went, would relate to oh, yeah. coming vote in October? Because that let, was a big surprise. Right. Let me tell you another struggle that I was involved in. It was one of the best and most fun struggles that I ever was involved with. And this was the uh, about the founding of the Women's Health Center, and that was in 72. So there was a space of about maybe four months between the jackal in our case and then the opening of the Women's Health Center. And so in uh, November of that year, the town of Colchester put this thing on the ballot that said the following, and see, it was a trick question. The, by the way, the Women's Health Center was opening in Colchester, Vermont, not Burlington, but in Colchester. And so the town fathers, as we would call them, put on the ballot this question. Do you approve of an unlicensed clinic in the town of Colchester? Okay, so people can understand what that meant or not. I mean, uh, Justine, do you get it, sort of? Yeah, yes. Okay. okay, so we thought we were gonna lose that. I remember that we tried stupidly, and now I look back on it, we tried to keep it off the ballot, 
even because we were so fr afraid we'd lose. And I remember going to court. I was the plaintiff in the case. Um, and the, my attorney was this guy named Jim Morse, who subsequently been on, was on the Vermont Supreme Court. He always reminds me if I see him, I was his first client. He was a very young attorney. I was the plaintiff. And we tried to keep that off the ballot and we lost. But he reports that when he went back into chambers to talk about the judge, talk with the judge, whose name was Judge Valenti from Rutland, so an Italian Catholic, Judge Valenti said, why are you here with all those baby killers? So that was that, that guy was going to be open minded. Right. Anyway, so we, we lost that case. It was on the ballot. And guess what? We campaigned like crazy. We, we even went to church parking lots and stuck, you know, pamphlets in the windshields of people, at, especially at the Catholic Church. OK, and there was a big meeting the night before the vote in the town of Colchester. We all went and all these nuns showed up. And they had all these little fetuses in bottles. And they said, this is what you're doing to these little Johnnies and little Susies. It was really fun, actually. It was really fun. Anyways, the town meeting was really, it was the first time ever that I spoke in public even. So the next day was the vote. And actually we won two to one on that vote. In other words, the town of Colchester voted that they did want unlicensed clinics in Colchester. And that you're right. And Grant is remembering that Colchester was like Winooski in terms of its Catholic population. Um, but I mentioned that because in the privacy of people's ballot box, I think, I don't know, what are your what are your guesses? I we won that two, you know, two to one in a Catholic town. What do you think? I mean, are people in this country, do you suppose? Pro women, pro choice, or not? What do you think? Anybody who has a thought on it, what do you think? I think they're more or less. I think they're more for less government intrusion. Is my thoughts on that? And so, and so maybe that's why they voted that way. They didn't no, want to I, Right. I mean, they. I think many Americans of any religion feel that. Um, that you're right that people don't want the government telling what, them what to yeah. do in the bedroom i really do okay i think they have to assume the consequences what? the people in their bedroom yeah right. nobody, 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 nobody come in and raise all these kids either i know no okay i was um i taught a long time justine at johnson state university too and i can remember that we took a poll in my class and all the men are pro-choice too they don't want to be paying child support for the rest of their lives, you know, for maybe, maybe for a one night stand. I mean, I hate to be that flippant about it, but I mean, I think that men do consider that or, or that they should. Okay. Joanne had something in the chat, right, Joanne? And I think Jane had a question or a comment. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the majority of I and mean, when when they take opinion polls, the majority of Americans believe in the in the right to have an abortion. Correct. If I if I if I remember correctly, if I if I remember correctly, and 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 Vermont is and Vermont has has been a pro pro choice state, dis, despite there being the presence of 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 some right to life. Of some right to life groups that have been protesting at at at, at the Planned Parenthood um, clinics um, in Burlington sometimes. Um, so I I think I I think we're probably a safe state for 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 for, for passing it, unless people get intimidated by by um, by the right to, by by the by, by the so called pro lifers. Um, 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 what's the person? What's the percentage of people who people? Ask it. Okay, Elsie has a question. Yes, I wanted. Um, my question is: What's the percentage of uh, women and men who are pro-choice in Vermont? I in would say Vermont. Yeah, referring the, to what Sandy was saying. Does anybody have a comment on that, other than me? I think that from the beginning um, that 
60% of Americans define themselves as, I would say pro-women, but also, of course, the common parlance is pro-choice. So I'll use both. But to me, Roe v. Wade and all of those pro-choice um, arguments are really arguments for women's rights over their bodies. And I think we forget that. I think that gets us into an argument about when a fetus is viable, when a fetus is not. The fact is, I think in the legality of the situation, the only person involved at this moment is the woman herself, the pregnant woman, who I think the court in Roe v. Wade said that that was a person and that person, she had the right to make medical decisions free of the interference of the government, I think. But anyway, I just want to 60 percent. Anyway, I just want to point out um, for those of you who are in Vermont, which I think is probably everybody but me, um, I am in a not safe state. I'm in Florida and we have passed a 15 week uh, or we are this week. We have been flying our 15 week abortion ban through the legislature and it's going to vote tomorrow. Um, I think that safe states should be worried as well, because if you're a safe state that does provide abortions, right. you're going to start seeing the overflow and the effects of women from states like Florida and Texas and Mississippi who are going out of state to get an abortion because they can. And that's because those women have the privilege of the funds of being able to do so. And so here's where it comes down is the women who can't afford it, black and brown communities are gonna be most affected by these bans because you're gonna have you know, poor neighborhoods and poor women not being able to afford to go to those safe states to get abortions or to get the medical procedures that they need. And so I think safe, safe states should be worried as well. I don't think we can forget that and get into this bubble of I'm in Vermont, so I'm safe, or I'm in New York, so I'm safe, because the effects of other states are going to compound and affect the safe states as well. And then another thing I just want to put out there is often when we have pro-choice fighters, I think too often we go out there with good intentions and we narrow the argument to our yeah. counterparts of what about what about um, incest? What about rape? What about this and that? And I think we are doing ourselves a disservice by making those arguments because the need for an abortion does not need to be a tragedy in order to be something that you want. It doesn't need to be tragic. And I think it's very important that we keep the focus on this is a medical decision for a uh -huh. woman and her doctor and not pigeonhole ourselves by what about incest? What about rape? What about this? What about that? It doesn't need to be a tragedy. You can get an abortion because you want one and because that's what suits your needs. And so I just, I like to make that point when I'm talking about this. So we don't get into this vortex of now we find ourselves down the road where abortions allowed for some incidents, but not others. Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good point because Roe v. Wade was really about women's rights. It was not about only about abortion. It was about a woman's rights to make medical decisions in accordance with her own conscience um, and in consultation, if she wants to, with a doctor. But it was about women and pregnant women in particular. Anyone else have any uh, final thoughts? So what are your predictions about this Prop 5? What do you think? But Robin said something interesting. I don't know if she's still with us. I wanted to point that out. I think that putting it on the ballot might very well subsume our whole election in November. And that is what worries me. It really worries me that that will become kind of the dividing line and the most talked about issue. And there are so many other issues. I really, in some ways, wish that that could have waited or not been put on the ballot at all. But anyway. The other thing to do yeah. is I'm seeing some of the comments with the opinion polls that may be public opinion but we're not a popular vote country we're what our legislators vote for so even if the the public at large is in favor of abortion um that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be what the lawmakers vote for 
Um, I'd like to jump in about the privacy of the uh, ballot box, which I think uh, Sandy brought up. And I think that's important because what I'm wondering is what are the Trump people, the people who follow him, uh, is this a big issue for them? Because to my mind, Trump, I, I think he was anti-abortion. Um, he Im, he imposed the <laughs> gag uh, law, uh, which uh, takes money away from helping uh, clinics overseas to be able to provide abortion. So, I mean, on a sort of an official way, but obviously he lived a life where he would be glad to he, he he would he has the morals of a person i mean that he would not stop for a moment to to avoid a uh, an abortion all i'm saying is i'm just wondering what the trump people how they will vote uh once they are in the ballot box and i have the feeling they will vote for this um this bill that will be in vermont um, first of all, can I comment on that, Robin? I don't think you can lump Trump voters that way. Um, I was in a discussion group in which there were Trump voters, women and men. They basically, the hostility toward them was so great from the Democrats that they eventually left that group, however. But I listened to them and they were pro-choice. And they said, and they said what many libertarians say. I mean, you've got to remember that Trump voters are not any one thing. They are, some of them are extremely pro-fetus, extremely, and anti-abortion. But some of them are libertarians, and a libertarian yeah. believes that government shouldn't interfere with your most intimate decisions, even yeah. when those decisions are being made by women. Yeah. So I, I think that the polls will show most people are pro-choice. However, I don't know if most people are pro a constitutional amendment. You remember Robin and you were involved when the ERA hit the ballot here, remember that? That lost mm -hmm. and it did. It lost not because people hate women, it, it, it lost I believe because people don't want the constitution changed. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I really don't know. I wish, I wish, I wish the proponents well. I just don't want that to be the main argument of the November elections, just like you said, you know. But anyway, any any final thoughts or questions? Okay, well, Justine, any final thoughts from you? And uh, could you just say one other thing, uh, Justine? Well, so what is going on in Florida? We are passing a bill very similar to the one that was passed in Mississippi that's in front of the Supreme Court right now. It's a 15 week ban. And I haven't read the full text of it. So I don't know if it's civil or criminal, uh, but I do know it's a 15 week outright ban. And you're gonna, in Florida, you think is gonna pass it? Yes. Oh, how do you know that? Just because that's what the polls are saying? That is the makeup of our legislator. Yeah. So right. I went to an abortion march a couple months ago and there was a large turnout, but it was in Orlando, which is one of the more progressive areas of Florida. And the law has been passing historically fast through our legislator over the last uh, couple of months. And it just passed the last committee. And so I believe it's up for a vote tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, well, call me after that then and let me know how it goes, would you? Or, or email me, would you do that? Yes. All right, well, thank you. Any final questions before we let Justine get back to her sunshine? Is the sun still out or is it dark yet? No, it's dark out. <laughs> okay, but it'll be sunny tomorrow without snow, right? Because she It should be, yeah. should be. Thank you very much. And we will see everybody next week. Next week, we'll be discussing another issue close to Floridians' hearts, and that is Cuba and the 60 years that the United States has had a blockade or what they call a blockade. 
or we call an embargo against Cuba, which is like 90 miles from you. Is that right, Justine, or more? That's correct. Okay, so see you then. Thank you very much for Justine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.